Hey everyone, my name is Tanay Jail, and I'm super excited to be chatting with you all today. In this talk, I'm going to be sharing with you all the reasons why I think there is so much potential in creating user impact via fintech products, and why there's so much energy and momentum in this space in the last couple of years in general. We will start out with a brief introduction to my story and my kind of windy path towards working in fintech. Then we'll put on the lens of a product manager who's setting out to create user impact via fintech and go through the strategic and product challenges that we're going to face along the way. Through this hypothetical situation, we'll dive into how to define impact, how to navigate complexity, and how to evolve your product. So this talk is not about me, but let me give you some context as to how I ended up here. I started off my career at LinkedIn, where I worked on the job seeking team, building the end-to-end -end experience of someone looking for a job on the LinkedIn platform. While I was there, I helped start a brand new team that was focused specifically on the blue collar or first line workforce, such as retail employees and food service workers, and to scale the LinkedIn platform to their job seeking needs. From there, I moved to China to bridge my interests in product management and public policy, where I focused on a wide variety of things through the Schwartzman Scholars Program, uh, things like mis and disinformation, cybersecurity, uh, data privacy, things like that. And this is kind of where my interest in fintech really sparked, because while living in China, you know, one of the most noticeable day-to-day -day trends was how impactful fintech was for the everyday person, from food vendors who could accept payments seamlessly to millions of Chinese people that could use uh, digital apps for savings and investing. I joined Google after that, where I was a PM working on Google Pay, uh, building spending and savings tools to improve people's financial well-being. And currently, I'm at Stripe, where I'm a PM working on improving access to lending and financing for small businesses through Stripe Capital. Through all these experiences, a central mission for me has been building economic opportunity through technology products. And this mission strongly overlaps with FinTech. At its best and when designed with intention, FinTech can be a way to scale financial health and well-being for anyone. So now let's get into the real stuff, which is how exactly to accomplish that. Today, let's pretend that we're all product managers who are looking to build a FinTech product that helps enhance the financial well-being of users. Today is day one, and we're trying to decide what we should be building and how to create the most user impact. So if you're new to the space, you'll probably start somewhere like here by looking at an industry chart of the FinTech ecosystem. Things like crypto, insurance, remittances, and robo-advisors are neatly sorted into their own categories in terms of what we could be building. Because of frameworks like this, we often see impact in FinTech framed in terms of what we are trying to build, like an alternative financial system, for example. And as we get started, it's tempting to do two things. One is to think about FinTech products in these specific silos, and two is just to kind of pick one of these segments and jump right in. But if you're someone who's looking to deliver an impactful fintech product that improves the financial lives of users, instead of approaching this problem with this chart, I actually suggest flipping the script and starting with the first principles of what users want when it comes to their money. If we really break it down, there are five things that people want to do with their money in the interest of improving their financial situation. The first is people want to move money easily. It's crazy that in 2022, it is still so hard to move money. Even with the growth of fintech, tons of payments are still happening via ACH, paper checks, international cross-border transactions that are very complicated, and other slow and inefficient transaction methods. The second thing people want to do with their money is they want to save money consistently. 40% of Americans in a survey stated that they would struggle to come up with $400 for an emergency expense. And we've seen over the last few years of the pandemic how kind of acute this need has been. The third is people want to borrow money conveniently. Across both the personal and business spaces, financing can be incredibly difficult to come by. For example, in the SMB space, we see that access to capital is one of the primary bottlenecks to growth for small businesses in the US. The fourth thing is spending money frugally. A survey by Intuit in 2020 found that almost two thirds of Americans don't know how much money they actually spent the last month it can be super difficult to track expenses and know where to uh, cut costs for your budget. And finally, people wanna grow money wisely. 90% of stocks today in the US are owned by just 10% of Americans, which leaves a lot of the rest of Americans wondering what are the best ways to invest and grow my money? So if we kind of zoom out, these are you know, the five things that people want to do with their money and what they want from their financial lives. 
for today's exercise, let's just pick one of them, save money consistently, and see kind of how the space looks. So for the vast majority of Americans today, their checking and savings accounts are the primary tool they use to save money consistently. But for this user needs, what are the fintech solutions that are emerging today? First off, we have neobanks like Chime and Current, who are trying to build the new, new banking experiences for users with a focus on financial health, savings, and no fee propositions. But it's not just products in the banking space that are tackling this user need. We also have investing apps like Robinhood and Wealthfront that are building cash management features and cash accounts complete with debit cards to help you store and save. We also have crypto companies like Coinbase and Gemini that will accept your direct deposit and help you earn a high APY with DeFi. Also in the fray are payments apps like Venmo and Cash App. They're starting to offer features like check cashing and early tax refunds. And we even have platforms like Shopify that are not fintech companies at their core who have products like Shopify Balance that helps merchants keep and save money on their platform. What's really interesting here is that all five of these companies showed up in different boxes in the industry chart that we just took a look at. But when we start with the user problem, the silos from that chart break down a little bit. And we start to see that the industry and its players can be grouped by what they're trying to help users do rather than which fintech niche they belong to. Although each of these players are building different products from each other in different ways, and savings is of varying levels of importance to each of them depending on their product strategy, they each have features that are addressing this kind of same user problem. This always reminds me of that famous Reed Hastings comment that Netflix's greatest competitor isn't actually just a bunch of other streaming services, it's sleep. Because the true focus of your product shouldn't be on what you're building, but rather what your users are trying to do, which in Netflix's case is deciding how to spend their free time. So for this reason, I recommend starting with some of these core user needs rather than focusing on where in the fintech industry you are uh, when you're kind of thinking about how to be users first. So let's say now that you know, we've decided we wanna work in this field of saving, helping users save money consistently, and we're starting to think about our product. And as we're learning and building in the space, we're encountering a lot of complexity that exists in our financial system. Let's talk about the different kinds of complexity we might be encountering. The first kind is technical complexity. The fact that we have to both work with the existing financial system and financial rails, and also invent new approaches and abstractions at the same time. We have partner complexity. The fact is that no one builds fintech products in isolation, and so you have a large host of partners to, to work with and connect with when it comes to different elements of financial infrastructure. We have marketing complexity. The fact that the financial system and money movement is super complicated and fragmented, and just explaining these products to an end user can be really difficult. We have competitive complexity. The fact that the industry itself is changing literally every day, and your competitors are shipping features at lightning fast speeds. We have trapdoor complexity. The fact that sometimes decisions are made at an infrastructure level that are really deep and difficult to unwind down the road. And we have regulatory complexity. The need to understand the myriad of laws, licenses, and legal requirements in this space. What I think is really unique about fintech is that these complexities arise not just when you're creating your strategy or doing annual planning, but for nearly every feature of your product. For our imaginary savings app, each of these complexities emerge when we're building onboarding, savings accounts, interest rates, account closure, KYC, third-party integrations, P2B payments, and so much more. As an illustrative example, let's suppose we're trying to build mobile check deposit functionality for our savings app so we can allow users to deposit their paychecks. We'll encounter each of these types of complexity in this process. On the regulatory side, Reg CC and funds availability notices are requirements that require us to disclose to users and help set their expectations when their money will be available. We'll have technical complexity. What technology do we use to capture check information and fight fraud? We have partner complexity. Who should we be working with as a check processing partner? We have marketing complexity. How do we explain to a user when their money is gonna be available? There's competitive complexity with different players launching their own check hashing functionality. And there's trap door complexity. Once we start offering the ability for this, it'll be super hard to unwind down the road if we're ever trying to simplify our app or move in a different direction as users begin to rely on this core part of the experience. It can be overwhelming to navigate this much complexity and a feature that you thought was a molehill can quickly turn into a mountain. Here are a few tips when navigating feature level complexity, which we'll kind of go through with our mobile check deposit feature. 
First is make sure to differentiate in your product strategy, table stakes features versus innovative features. And ask yourself whether the complexity you're digging through is going to make you stand out as a product or just kind of meet a table stakes requirement. The more innovative your product, the higher your bar should be for what kind of complexity you're willing to tolerate. And for table stakes features like maybe check deposit, which PayPal only launched last year and got you know, by without for many, many years, maybe trim scope and do only what's necessary to check the box. Second, understand why the complexity exists so you can connect threads across features. And this will help you decide what your best approach should be and what other features your solutions can help scale for. For example, you know, regulations around funds availability were passed as early as the 80s to help give users clarity on when they could expect money that was kind of in limbo. So this same concerns and principles could come up for other forms of money movement. And so when we're thinking through how we can, you know, meet regulatory requirements for check deposit, we can also make sure to think through this for other features and use cases where it comes up. And finally, and most importantly, don't let complexity ever reach your users. Keep in mind the simplicity and intuitiveness that they want from their money. The best fintech solutions not only navigate that web of complexity, they make it invisible for the end user. So now fast forward, you know, you built your first version of your savings app and things are going really well. You're getting some users, you're starting to see growth in deposits and you're wondering what's next. You've got users attached to a hero use case, but how do you grow from there? This is a super common problem and the pattern is always the same. A fintech app starts with the hero user journey it acquires users, it builds momentum, and then it realizes that it needs something more. It needs to move on to new use cases. And this realization comes for one of three reasons. And I'll explain what those reasons are through some real life examples. Let's take three popular apps, Robinhood, Chime, and Venmo, each of which have had breakout success in different fintech niches, investing, banking, and payments. The first reason is the need to make your current features work better. This is what Robinhood probably experienced many years ago when they realized that a huge barrier for getting people to invest and creating a faster investing experience was the need to first move money into your Robinhood account from your bank account. And they thought about how investing would be easier if people just stored their money in the app. The second reason to think about expansion is to keep your users interested and retained. Chime had seen a lot of growth and demand for their bank account and likely realized that while this is great, a bank account isn't the best daily use case. It's something that users check once in a while when their paycheck comes in or when they wanna look through their transactions, but they could be doing better in terms of keeping users engaged and retained for a longer period of time. My guess is they started looking around for something that would get users to open Chime multiple times a day. And that's why they started thinking about use cases around payments to pay their friends and family for ongoing expenses. The third reason to kind of expand into new use cases as a FinTech app is to keep up with the competition. Venmo started, of course, with P2P payments, but I think it's fair to say that the entrance of Cash App has had an impact on their product strategy and roadmap. Given the roaring success that Cash App has had with crypto investing, Venmo has made a sharp and noticeable pivot to incorporate crypto investing in their strategy, even making it one of the home tabs in their latest design. And that's how we get to kind of where we are today, where so many FinTech apps have built adjacent products to their core use cases. All of this is to say, you're basically in good company. Lots of fintechs have experienced the need to grow their product suite, but there's a really kind of clear way to think about it and how to approach it. So here's a couple things to keep in mind as you evolve your fintech product. The first thing is build off the core use cases that users already trust you for. For example, we see Cash App do this with their recent foray into taxes. Americans across the country used Cash App to get their stimulus checks a few days early using their direct deposit feature during the pandemic. And Cash App is leaning into that user trust and value in their tax product by emphasizing that you can get your refund faster too. That's a great strategy for helping bridge users from your core use case into new things you want them to try. The second is use feature functionality to deepen your core product. What this means in a nutshell is when users expand into your new feature, their existing features get better too. Chime demonstrated this in their credit builder product which offers users a secured backed credit card to help them build their credit score. This meant that users could still use the Chime account they loved, but get an added bonus of a boosted credit score via the same product interactions. Using heuristics like this can help us decide what's the next area we should be expanding into for our savings app, and what's the right direction to lean into for our product. 
So just to kind of sum up, right, as we're going through this journey, here's a few things that we've discussed as we're building the savings app. The first thing is remember, start with the user problems, not necessarily the industry niche. It'll help you stay grounded on what core functionality you want your product to have and how you can expand. The second is pick your battles when it comes to complexity and make sure that you abstract it away from your users. And the final thing is, you know, make sure to build off of core use cases when you're evolving your product. Start with the things that people already trust you for and ask yourself how new features and new experiences can feed back into your core user journeys. A big theme throughout this talk that I hope sticks with you is that users really, really, really care about their experiences with fintech products because it has to do with their core relationship with money. So while this means there is a high quality bar for fintech products, it also means that there is a ton of potential for impact if you do this right. Thanks so much for your time. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on LinkedIn if you have any questions. And thanks again.